Well, good morning, folks. My name is Jeff Distroft. I'm one of the elders here, and uh, on behalf of the elders, welcome to Parkview. And more importantly, welcome to what we're doing here today, which is worshiping the living God. As we come together, we recognize and embrace the fact that each of us are in different places in our journey in faith, but regardless of where you're at in that journey, we've come together to offer each of you Christ and the opportunity to come closer to him. So whether you're a first-time attender of Parkview or been a long-time member, please know that you are welcomed by us and loved by God, and it's that God who calls us to worship. As we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, we share David's words in Psalms 95, which read in part, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful no noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down to kneel before the Lord our Maker. I'll wrap up the, um, the call to worship with Paul's words from Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. And there, there are two parts to that. You know, the first, how to stir up one another to love and good works. And I just love the, uh, the sweet sentiment that is embedded in those words. It feels to me like the essence of our roles as Christians. And can you imagine what our world would be like if every day we spent some time stirring up one another to love and good works? And then you think about the second half and the second part, which reads encouraging one another. And as we look back over the past 12 or 13 months, has there really been a time or a more important time for us to encourage one another? Isn't it a wonder that if we imagine the God of the universe in a man, it would look like Jesus? Parfu, let us stand and worship that man.
Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting God so loved the world Amen This is the good news of the gospel That God so loved the world That he sent his one and only son So that whoever believes in him Shall not perish but have eternal life He has come to save sinners and sufferers like you and me. Each and every one of us comes every morning in need of a Savior, in need of someone to heal us from our brokenness. 1 John 1.8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But the good news is that 1 John 1.8 isn't stand, doesn't stand alone. It's, it's immediately followed with one of the most beautiful verses. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, each and every one of us comes every morning in need of a Savior, in need, to some, in need of someone to save us. And so if we are quick to confess, the Lord is quick to forgive. And so we're going to celebrate this truth, this wondrous mystery that the, that the slain Jesus Christ, who has risen from the grave, has brought us into new life with him, this wondrous mystery that Christ, that God himself put on flesh to take our sin on his shoulders, to die the death that we deserve, and to bring us with him into new life. So celebrate this wondrous mystery, this wonderful truth that we have to celebrate today. Come behold the wondrous mystery In the dawning of the King He the theme of heaven's praises Robed in frail humanity In our longing, in our darkness Now the light of life has come Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom the truth of our redemption see the father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory grace unmeasured love
Slain by death, the God of life. But no pain could have restrained him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance. How unwavering our hope. Christ in power. Parkview. Um, Foster is going to be preaching on the resurrection and how it affects personal change today. Um, and because of that message, I've been blessed with the opportunity to share my testimony with you. Um, so I'm Gabby, if you don't know me. I'm the admin for our college ministry, aka I spend a lot of time with the young looking kiddos kind of over here. Um, and I'm also the front desk gal on Thursdays and Fridays. So if you ever call Parkview and you hear Parkview Church, this is Gabby. I'm that voice. <laughs> um, so I've kind of got that classic church kid start. My parents are really awesome believers. I went to church like for as long as I can remember. Um, I did all the VBS and Sunday school kids things. Um, but I just never really got that being a believer was more than just showing up, doing the things, and looking good. Um, my love for Christ was completely dependent on how I thought others viewed me, and this became really, really evident my senior year of high school when my family left an unhealthy church, and all of a sudden, all of my friends that were believers weren't allowed to talk to me anymore because I didn't go to, I didn't go to the church. So, um, yeah, I, I made the mistake of blaming God for the sins that had been committed against me, and I was so angry and hurt, and I just let that, like, stay inside of me, and I held on to it until it became depression and anxiety, and I just was left completely empty and hopeless, um, and because of that, then, I was in and out of an abusive relationship because I just needed somebody to want me, and I came to college, and I started drinking and doing drugs because I just needed to cope with the lack of feelings I had. I was doing everything I could to get away from God, and he had every right to give up on me, but his perfect love for me meant that he was, and he still is, willing to be patient with me. He spent that freshman year placing believers on my floor that continued to faithfully invite me to brunch, into friendship, in community, and then eventually to 24-7, even though I said no for a really long time before finally saying yes. Um, there are people that haven't left me just because I'm broken, but, but inst instead they share their brokenness and their sin with me and use that to point me to Jesus and how he is so much more committed to me than any of them will ever be. To a God who, when I was at my lowest, chose to die a slow and painful death that I deserved, and then he rose again. When the creator of the world is willing to do that for me, why should I fear anyone on this earth leaving me? And that's not to say I don't fear. <laughs> I'm afraid of lots of things still. Um, I continue to fail. I place way too much worth in how others view me still, but the Lord has grace, and he's given me a deep understanding of his unending love and forgiveness for me because he looks at me and sees the sacrifice of his perfect son in place of all of my mess-ups and screw-ups and disappointments. He sees Jesus, and he loves me because of his son. Thanks.
Thank you, Gabby. I appreciate that so much. That is a great testimony. And just in case I forget to do an application today, just remember what she said, and we will be good, right? So uh, it's great to be back with you guys this morning at Central Campus. Uh, my name is Dave Foster. In case you haven't run across me before, I'm usually up at North Campus uh, these days, but uh, I love coming back here and getting a chance to open God's Word and lead us in a time of understanding what he's trying to say to us, especially with this theme of resurrection and what the resurrection means to us and how it changes us. So in that light, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and beg the Heavenly Father to make this clear to us. Father, we come to you this morning full of expectation, desiring to forget the rest of our lives beyond these doors for just these few minutes. Father, may our focus, may our attention, may our devotion and love be towards you. Father, not just so that we can gain understanding to help us, but Father, because we truly want to worship you. The things you have done for us, Lord, the things that you've put in motion for us as believers in Christ is truly astounding. Not to be understood, not to be believed in a sense, but yet, Father, nevertheless, it is so true. Father, your son rose from the dead by your power through the Holy Spirit. And as we sit here today, Lord, as the inheritors, the benefactors, those who are receiving an estate from you, we just say thank you and pray, Lord, that you would help us together with all your saints from around the world this morning to praise you, to learn about you. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be focused on a passage to start off this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you want to go ahead and turn over to that, we're going to be looking specifically at verse 17. So if you've been with us over the last few weeks, we've been talking about resurrection. Uh, we kind of led into that from Easter. We've taken that long walk from Galilee to Jerusalem, right, uh, to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, to the garden outside the tomb where Jesus reveals himself as the ascended uh, God that he is, uh, to the women that came that morning, to the upper room where he talks to his disciples, back to Galilee where he uh, convicts his main disciple Peter to say, you know, feed my sheep, back to the Mount of Olives just outside of Jerusalem where he ascends into the clouds with the disciples gaping upwards, mixture of fear, sadness, reverence, worship, awe. And the angel says, what are you looking at? you men go into Jerusalem and await the filling of the spirit and they knew that was the command of their Lord and so they did and as we gather here today as heirs and descendants of that command we also as believers in Christ have been filled with this spirit but here's the problem sometimes as believers we have a hard time understanding and believing what we're reading in scripture uh, the Apostle Paul, I'm just going to read this really quick for us, verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And if you've been a believer for any amount of time and you've come to church or Bible studies, you have uh, go online and you listen or you read a book, we get so used to these kind of terms, new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. And we can read in Ephesians 4, Colossians 3, similar verbiage. And after a while, we just struggle with this. Because here's the problem. Here's the, the problem we have is that we still see ourselves the way that we've always been. You know, it doesn't matter how old physically you are. But if you've been a believer in Christ for any amount of time, you have the reality of how you live your everyday life, the fears, the temptations, the failures, the things that you know you should be doing. You hear pastors, you hear speakers, and they're talking about going out and changing the world for Christ, the Great Commission, and so forth. 
and you recognize that you fall way short of such lofty goals and it's discouraging and we after a while we become resistant in a sense we put on a shell that says I dare you to convince me that I'm anything other than the mediocre Christian that I am and if we're not careful we'll go to our maker with those thoughts in our minds well this morning I would like you to walk with me on a little journey through the word so that you can discover how different you are as a believer in Christ. Those kind of thoughts are just not truth. They're not the truth from God. They're not the truth from his son, Jesus Christ. They're not the truth that the Holy Spirit puts into you when you become a believer. So let's just take a, a careful look here. At 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh, 17, it's, it's sincerely related to what Paul has previously written back in chapter 3 of this same book, verse 18, when he says, and we all, and I like this part in COVID, with unveiled faces, <clears throat> beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is spirit. Think about this. We're all with unveiled faces. Paul is saying when we fully understand, when we remove the years of crud, it's, it's like taking your car into a car wash and you just spray it with that high pressure hose and all that dirt, you get up under the wheel whales and you're just removing rust, dirt, snow, all that kind of junk comes off. We're unveiled. We see truthfully what God has done. We behold the glory of the Lord. That's going to be important later. You're going to see the glory of God. We are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. We're in constant process as believers in Christ. Uh, you fail, so did I. You sin so do I. You don't measure up to John Piper, Tim Keller, all the great heroes of the faith. I don't either. But still, it's undeniable. Scripture says we're being transformed. We're being renewed with unveiled faces. The truth is there. So back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, what we have here is kind of a great statement here. Paul makes four crisp antithetical statements. He says they are launched by the conditional statement if anyone is in Christ. So this morning I ask you, are you in Christ? Do you know your Savior? If you do, no matter for how long, here are some truths, and here's what Paul's saying. It can mean several things, and none of these are mutually exclusive, right? It can mean that one belongs to Christ. You are his before you weren't. Now you are. This is a truth. Put it in the bank, right? <clears throat> that one lives in the sphere of Christ's power. Before you didn't, but now you do. You don't live your life by your strength. You live your life, even when you can't feel it, by his strength. Thirdly, that one is united with Christ. Before you weren't, but now you are, right? Right? And lastly, you are part of the body of Christ. Uh, he means that literally. You, you, you belong somewhere in the anatomical wholeness of Jesus Christ. You might be the toe, you might be the head, you might be an eyelash, I don't know. But God knows. And just as important as every part of your body is, so you are important to his body now you are part of the believing community before you weren't but now you are four statements if anyone is in christ paul's assumption is that being in christ should produce a radical change in a person's life because you see this is the first point here the resurrection profoundly changes who you are there was life before the resurrection. Now there is life after the resurrection. And because of that singular moment in history, 
when Jesus defeated death and sin and rose to sit at the right hand of his Father, our lives are profoundly changed. Our beings are profoundly changed. These truths are clear to us. One belongs to Christ. One lives in the sphere of Christ's power. One is united with Christ. We've talked about all of these since Easter. One is in the body of Christ. We belong together. You may have a terrible family experience. You may come from abuse. You may come from neglect. Or just simply from people who don't seem to care a whole lot. But when you are part of the body of Christ, you are in something that is nothing like you've ever experienced before. What a joy it is to come into the church building. I was just talking to a lady in the back here this morning. We could sit at home and watch TV. It's like watching slides of your family, looking at pictures out of your, your photo album. But then you get to go to the family reunion. Yeah, you've got to put up with that obnoxious uncle. Yes, you've got to eat some really kind of gross food sometimes. But you've got a sense of belongingness that you can't get anywhere else. In fact, people might say, you know, you look an awful lot like that guy over there. That's, that's right, we're related. I can't tell you much about him, but I'm telling you right now. We are related. If you were to line up my mom's four brothers in a row and put me next to them and turn us around, you would have a hard time telling us apart. And I know that's a frightening thought to you guys, <laughs> but that's the truth. And what a great feeling. Like, I belong here. I belong here. Now, all my uncles are dead. I've lived long enough to see them pass but I still belong. The neat thing about Christ's family, it's never dead. It rotates, people come, people go, but we belong. The resurrection profoundly changes us. Christians see the world when we become believers in a new way uh, that we have ever seen it before. We're joined to Christ. It's, it's, it's an incredible experience. The old has gone. This phrase tells us that we're to interpret that the old order, the way that we used to live, has gone away. When you walked in here today, who were you? And yes, I'm using that sort of in a passive sense, in the past sense. Who were you? How would you identify? If I said, take out a card right now and write down, who is Craig Vanderlees? Who is Jeff Disterhoff? Who is Beth? Who is Aubrey? What would you write? Well, what's my identity? Um, let's see. For me, I would write, and then I would start, I'd say, I'm this old, and I'm married, and I've got three daughters, and I've done this job for a long time, and all this kind of stuff. And that's our identity. But Paul is saying, now think this over again. Take that card, and in your head, rip it up. Throw it away. That's your old identity. Paul says the old has passed away. These things don't define you anymore. You, you're rich, God doesn't care. You're poor, you, you really struggle to survive every month, God doesn't care. You're sick, see the doctor way too often, you're frightened of your health, God doesn't care. You're athletic, you're strong, you're young, you're in college, you're old, you're retired. None of these identifiers make a bit of difference to the Lord. He rips them up, throws them away, because the only thing that matters is that you are in Christ. Behold, if anyone is in Christ, since the resurrection, it has profoundly changed you. God will use your sickness. God will use your youth. God will use your age. God will use your education. God will use your finances. Everything becomes his. And he's going to so use it in ways that you can't possibly imagine. The individual's whole being, his value system and behaviors are so changed through conversion. We are dead to sin 
but we're alive in Christ, it says in Romans 6, verse 11. Denny writes of Paul, the apostle, the past was dead to him, as dead as Christ on his cross. All its ideas, all its hopes, all its ambitions were dead in Christ. He was another man in this universe. Paul would have identified himself as a highly trained rabbi, as a persecutor of those who did not follow the law. But in Christ, everything radically changed. And so when Paul writes this, he knows to which he is speaking. And that should be the truth for us as well. The oldest passed away. Who were you when you walked in this morning? Who will you be when you walk out? If the answer is the same, we are to be pitied more than any people because we don't grasp what Paul is saying. We don't believe what the world... See, here's the problem. We are so used, most of us, to feeling passe, blasé, mediocre about our walk with Christ that we come here with the hope that something's going to click, something's going to shift in our minds, and we're going to get that special something that we read about in others, and we're going to somehow change our lives when we walk out. And I'm, I'm saying to you today, it's already happened if you're a believer. It's already the truth. You are a totally different being. You are a new creation, Paul writes here. New creation. Where, do, where else do you experience new creations? How do you have any ability to grasp what that means? Well, if you've been fortunate enough to see a child come into this world, right? Uh, that's a new creation. It's so exciting. Uh, I've had kids, I've had grandkids, and I'm telling you, everyone is a treasure. Life is full of possibilities at that point, right? Right? That baby that comes in, you look at it and you think, who are you going to be? Like your father, like your mother, like your grandparents, like your brother, like your sister? Maybe you look kind of like your great-grandmother. I think all newborn babies probably look a lot like their great-grandmothers when they're born. <laughs> but whatever that child's going to be, it's, it's endless possibilities. When you became a believer in Christ, Jesus likes to use that kind of metaphorical statement. You were born again. You're, you're new. And here's the neat thing. The newness never wears off. God's mercies are renewed to us every single morning. Wow. That's amazing. Tim Keller likes to kind of use the idea of a combustible engine. You have a downstroke and an upstroke right under the hood of that car the downstroke is I'm putting off everything in my life that is the old self that's what Ephesians 4 tells us we're going to put it away uh, what I was when I walked in here a man dominated by sexual sin a person dominated by envy by covetousness by gossip uh, by fear <laughs> That was the old Dave. I'm not supposed to be that person anymore. I wish I could sit here and tell you that that can happen like that. Maybe it does for you. But I can give testimony to the fact that you walk long enough with Christ and you strive to understand who he is and what it means to walk in him. And your life is going to radically change. Radically change. And if it isn't, there is something wrong. It would be like carrying a baby around. Oh, uh, Dave, that's such a beautiful little baby. Uh, when was that born? About 35 years ago. Isn't he cute? Yeah, look at that little thing. Still have to change his diaper seven times a day. But, and that's how we feel sometimes as believers. I'm just a babe in Christ. Well, you're a babe because you choose to be a babe. God wants you to grow. Put off that old stuff. You're no longer that person. Get rid of it, the Apostle Paul says. And the upstroke is, put on the new self. 
the new creation, the Son of God. All we have to do is read through Ephesians 1, and we get an idea of what we're supposed to be about. Uh, the resurrection does this for us. It changes fear to love, despair into joy. The resurrection changes people from being spiritually dead to alive in God. It changes guilty condemnation to a celebration of forgiveness and freedom. It changes anxiety into a hope that goes beyond the grave. It can change our sinful hearts so that they want to follow the Lord Jesus. It's not a challenge. It's not a must. It's not an oughta. It's I get to. What a privilege, right? Uh, the power of the resurrection is relentlessly killing sin in every true Christian. You can't do before, or what you did before today with the same enjoyment. Uh, Iona and I were just talking about this this last week. Uh, when I, we were first married, there were certain movies I felt very comfortable in watching, right? I loved horror movies. I loved, you know, and I say that, I'm not talking about the slash and dash, I'm talking about just the old classic universal type movies. And now when I watch those kind of things, I find, why am I doing this? What a waste of time, you know? Uh, we're, we're watching things like The Chosen right now, The Life of Christ, and we're just loving it. All we focus on, we try to focus on, is what it means to be a believer in Christ. That doesn't mean you can't be mixing it up in some other ways. We still want to be relevant to the people that we live and breathe and, and work with, but we don't want to neglect to emphasize the truth that Christians are supposed to be becoming new people. We are supposed to see the reality of our new position in Christ because of that resurrection. Many Christians have a meager expectation of to the extent in which we can today experience resurrection life and victory over sin. We've been beaten up so often, we have failed so often that we have just given up. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, never give up. Never give up. The resurrection is far from being something we only benefit from in heaven. It happens to us right now. Uh, we were watching the other night a, a show on Netflix, and it was you know one of those nature shows. Uh, I love to watch these, but this was a little different. You know, we we still had David Attenborough, you know, the British commentator, and he talks the whole way through it and tells you everything, and we really enjoyed that. But it was all about color. How animals can only see certain colors. Some see more than we see, some see less than we see. And he uses the term spectrum. Some animals have the ability to see two color spectrum, some three, and so forth. And it, it kind of explained to us like why tigers are orange. You think, well, if I'm a tiger and I've got to sneak up on a deer to get lunch, that being orange, it's kind of a tip off that I'm coming, right? I'm probably starved to death. But when you see the tiger through the eyes of a deer, specifically the deers that he hunts in central plains of India, you recognize that he's not orange. With their eyes, with the color spectrums they see, really the world is kind of a green. And they had special cameras that allowed us to see that tiger. And all of a sudden, instead of being an orange-striped tabby cat, this was a green animal, just sitting in the green leaves and grasses. And you couldn't see him. I mean, I knew he was there. They just showed me that. It was like being at the eye doctor. You know, is this better? Is this okay? Is it better? Is this okay? And the tiger was there, and then he wasn't there. And unless he moved, you couldn't tell he was sitting there. And as we talked about that, I thought, you know, that's really what's going on here. We see in a certain spectrum before the cross. I see Dave with all the problems he has and all the failures that he has accomplished and all, all this stuff. And I don't see me the way that God sees me. You see, that resurrection changes. It profoundly changes us. And if animals and insects we saw and fish can see the world differently than we as humans, 
I believe sincerely that God sees us differently. He sees us not as we are, as we think we are, but he sees us once we become believers in the spectrum of Christ's blood, which means that you're perfect. You've redefined the word perfect, Dave. Yes, I have. I have redefined the way <clears throat> that God sees us because of his son's sacrifice on the cross, because he took upon himself once and for all the sins of everyone. He took upon himself the sins of Dave, the past, the present, and anything I do in the future. I cannot send my way out of the spectrum of God's vision now. When I look at the body of Christ, the reason Paul is able to write this, if anyone is in Christ, these four statements is because he knows that God sees you in that way. When he sees his son, Jesus Christ, he looks one way. When he sees you, there is no distinguishing them. In fact, you are in his vision, one and the same. You are the sons and daughters of Christ. You do not bear the marks of your sin. You do not and you cannot atone for what you have done wrong. The blood of Christ is splashed upon you. Oh, this is great news. I hope you think this is great news. I do. When I switch to Ezekiel chapter 44, this brings us into clarity for me in a way that I've never understood it before. Ezekiel 44 seems like a weird place to go. If you read Ezekiel, you think this has got to be the only prophet on mushrooms or something like that because there's some weird stuff written in here. But he is having a vision of the temple. And I'm not going to read through the whole chapter, but just understand this. As you read it, I hope that you are struck with before the cross, how did God see us? Because the second point here is not only are, in the first point are we profoundly changed by the resurrection, the second point is the resurrection eternally changes how God sees us, right? I just said that a little bit ago, but that's the truth here. In chapter 44, we're looking at the holiness of God because Ezekiel's given a vision of the temple. And it's an amazing thing. If you start reading through it, you're going to say, oh, yeah, this is really amazing, Dave. It was two cubits by six cubits and two palm trees and four cubits and the inner hallway should be this way. And, the out and you're probably going to close your Bible and say, I don't want to read this. But don't give up on it. Because by the time you get to chapter 44, he is revealing to us how God saw us before the cross. He says in verse 1, He brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces east, and it was shut. And the Lord said, east, and it was shut. And the Lord said to me, The gate shall remain shut. It's not going to be opened, and no one can enter by it. The Lord, the God of Israel, has entered by it. That's the first thing he says. What? If you don't read this carefully, you're going to say, well, this is an interesting piece of architecture, and God has come in through the east gate, and now the door is shut. Well, great. No, don't miss it. Here's what God's saying. Once I come into my temple, one, and you've got to remember, Ezekiel is the prophet who most clearly sees the glory of God sitting by the Chinar canals, right? In chapter 1 and 2. He sees God's throne room opened up before him and the four living creatures, right? And the seraphim darting about, chanting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. He knows what the presence of God looks like. And to Ezekiel's vision, this God has entered through the east gate into the temple. And God says, no one else can come in to the temple by this gate. Why? Simply because it's holy now. And nothing before the cross on this world was holy, not like God. Wow. So no one can come in and do that. Secondly, he says, well, guess what? Uh, I'm going to put limitations on the Levites. Now, if you remember the Levites, they're the one of the 12 tribes of Israel, but they're the ones who don't get to inherit any land because their whole cause for existence 
is to actually serve God in the temple. But even the Levites in Israel's history have messed up. When the nation was going down the tubes, they were following idolatry. They were doing their own thing. Did the Levites stand up and say, no, this is wrong? No, they should have. They were the priests of God. They were, as we would think of them today, the pastors. And they should have said to the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, don't do this. God does not like this. But instead, they went along with it. And God now didn't just lays out in the next few verses why they will still be serving him, but their service is going to change. They no longer can come near to the presence of God. They're not holy enough. They still have a job. They're going to cut the meat. They're going to offer up the sin offerings. But they're not coming anywhere near to the presence of God. And on top of that, some of them have married foreign wives. People that were not of the people of Israel. If you look in verse 9, he says, Thus says the Lord God, no foreigner or uncircumcised in heart and flesh of all the foreigners who are among the people of Israel shall enter into my sanctuary. So not only did the Levites marry the wrong wives, but now, as was the custom back in old Israel, where foreign guards were hired to protect the temple, God is saying, no, no one. No one who is not circumcised, no one who is not part of the nation of Israel, no one is that holy can come near me. It's not going to happen. And as you read through the rest of this chapter, you get into what they can wear. I want my priests to wear linens, especially linens. And he even gets to a subset of the Levites, by the way, when you jump up to like verse 15, when he talks about Zadok, the sons of Zadok. Zadok was a priest, right? But he was given priesthood because of his parentage, his ancestors, Eleazar, who are related to Aaron, the brother of Moses. Uh, they can come closer to me. But even the priests of Zadok don't get to come into the presence of the Holy of Holies, into the very chamber of God anymore, because they messed up too. They're not that holy. And he says, when they put on these linens that are specially made for them, the turban and so forth, he says, let them wear nothing made of wool, which will cause them to sweat, because perspiring is not admittable into the holiness of God. And on their way out, after they've done their chores as priests, take off these linen clothes and leave them in the inner sanctum of the temple, lest they wear them outside. And the holiness, my holiness, comes into contact with the people of Israel. And what happens when God's holiness in any way touches a common person? They're gone. We see this in Leviticus chapter 10 in the story of Nadab and Abihu, right? Two of the sons of Aaron who put together in their censers the little swinging plates full of smoke that they did in their ritual worship of God. They offered, all it says is a strange fire. That's something God had not commanded. They got creative. More than likely, they did something that drew attention to themselves And what happens? It says that that fire that they created actually rose up and consumed them. So it would happen if they wore these clothes, these linen garments, out amongst the people. Before the cross, you aren't holy enough. Now there's some hope. You say, well, why did the sons of Zadok get any kind of mention? Well, there's something in ancient Near Eastern culture called the Covenant of Grant. And in the Covenant of Grant, you are given the privilege of doing things because of your ancestry. So Zadok, because of his ancestry, and he's long dead by the time we get to Ezekiel, but his sons get to minister just simply because they belong to Aaron. Remember that family reunion I was talking about? They just got that privilege. It's different than the suzerain treaties that were common in this day, where each generation is judged by their relative merits. In the covenant of grant, it's just, I belong. 
And so I'll do my duty as a Levite. I'll do my duty as a priest. I'll do my duty as a high priest. It doesn't make me holy. It just means that I belong. And that was common back then. Praise God. Do you see it? Now we switch to that other side of the cross. I hope you see it. Covenant of Grant. Who is our great high priest? Who have we been talking about for the last couple of weeks? Yeah, Jesus. Hebrews 7, right? Hebrews 4. Hebrews 10. All of those chapters say that we have a great high priest. And because Jesus is our great high priest, we have a covenant of grant. We now are associated with him. That's our identity. That's our family reunion. I don't care who you are, man, woman, what color you are here this morning, it all blends into the blood of Christ. world is going into flames to talk about social justice. I'm here this morning to talk to you about spiritual justice. The cross, the resurrection, spiritually lifts you because of that covenant of grant. And now you can go into the holy of holies, into God's presence. What happened on that hill of Golgotha when Jesus was crucified and he says it is finished in that holy of holies that curtain is ripped from the top down to the bottom it's been in existence for thousands of years people were not allowed in there they weren't holy enough and it's like God is saying now now you're a new creation if anyone is in Christ if you belong then you can come without fear of coming into contact with holiness. Because, like I said, Jesus and you, in God's spectrum of color, are now one. You're his. And Jesus said, Father, through all the stuff I have been through, through the resurrection and so forth, I ask of you to give to these people my inheritance, my standing, who I am in you. The resurrection makes a tremendous difference. Before the cross and the resurrection, we had Ezekiel 44. Got to wear the right clothes. I can't have a bodily defect. I got to be married to the right woman. I have to have a covenant of grant that takes me back so far. All this stuff after the cross, after the resurrection. If anyone is in Christ, he, she is a new creation. Let that which is old pass away. Whoever you were when you walked in here, man, I hope you're not that person anymore. Even if you were tracking with God, pretty cool. I want you to be a new person in Christ. Downstroke, get rid of the old stuff. Don't identify with who I was. I'm no longer Dave of Omaha. I am now Dave of Christ. Do you ever wonder why Christ gives a new name to some of his disciples? Probably to all of them, but the ones that are recorded that we know about, right? Matthew, Peter the Rock, Paul. It's because those are identifiers. He's saying you have a new identity. You no longer are those people. And it's because of the resurrection. If the resurrection is true, then everything I'm telling you this morning is as true. To deny what I'm telling you today is to deny your belief in the resurrection and in Jesus Christ being the Lord God himself. Do you want to go back? Do you want to go back to never getting to be part of the temple worship? I mean, unless you were fortunate enough to be one-twelfth of all the population of Israel and have some role in the outer courts of the temple like the Levites did, unless you were part of the one-twenty-sixth of the population of Israel and you happened to be a descendant of Aaron, you are a Zedekite, you would never even come close to the presence of God. But this morning when we gathered and you heard the singing and hopefully you were singing with them and you heard Gabby's testimony, 
and you're listening to the preaching of the word of God, you are the temple of God. Isn't that awesome? And you say, well, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. If anybody deserves it, please come out up here and take over. I don't know who deserves it. No one does. We give all praise and glory to Jesus Christ because he's the only one who deserves it. He's the only one that earns it. In the last days in the book of Revelation, I love that scene in the throne room of God, just like what Ezekiel's talking about. And the scroll of God of judgment comes out and this call goes out, who's worthy to open this? And the apostle John writing that book says, behold, I saw the lamb that was slain. Come forward, and he opens that scroll. Only he is worthy to do that. But we are his people. And in God's sight, the color spectrum is unified. There is no distinction. Again, no distinction on how much money you make, what education you have, how healthy you are or not. You're all the same in God. We are all the same in Christ. Man, the resurrection makes a difference. Let's pray. This morning we're just going to lead out in a time of prayer. I'm going to encourage you to pray on your own at some points, so listen carefully here. But we're just going to start off by saying, Thank you, Father. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And I just want you to spend a couple of seconds just praising God. Whatever God's laid on your heart this morning as a believer in Christ, whatever truth that you've grasped onto, just thank him. Praise him for what he's done. I'll let you do that for a couple of seconds. Father, who am I that you would see me in such a way? But Lord, since that's the fact of your word, who am I to deny it? I live in it. And I promise you, Father, that when I leave here today, I'm going to walk in it. Father, now we pray that you would help us to put away the old self. It is past. And I ask, Lord, that you would bring to our hearts anything that we're holding on to that we shouldn't be holding on to so that we can confess it as something that is from our old life and no longer part of our new life, whether that's how we see ourselves or others, anger, fear, whatever it may be, Lord, we pass it away. So pray that silently in your heart. Ask God to reveal that to you. Father, we just, we want to put on the new self. Your son has gotten that for us. It's a gift. Father, he's equipped us to live this life, to spread the joy of this word, to be a testimony to a lost and hurting world. Father God, we commit ourselves to being whatever it is you want us to be. Father, I pray now that you would bring to our hearts what our commission is, who it is that we need to speak to, who it is that we need to live purely before, who it is that we need to forgive. Father, cleanse our heart, scrub it, so that the newness of life in you will be evident to all who see us. 
Let's pray silently about that. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you we live this side of the cross, this side of the resurrection. Thank you for all that that means. Lord, may you never see me the way I was again. But may you see your son when you see me. And may that be true of the world and the people I live amongst as well. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have this wonderful hope in the resurrected Christ who has brought us new life. And so let's celebrate this wonderful new creation that we are as we, again, just confess, we pray to our Father in dependence and need on Him. So will you stand and sing these wonderful truths as we, as we express a Christian's daily prayer. Until I try.
Sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Get, give these guys a round of applause. You know you want to. Thank you, Will, and everybody. Really appreciate it. So, uh, One quick announcement before we close today. At Parkview, as you can see here, we worship not only as one large congregation, but we found it just as important to have smaller groups of circular relationships where we can encourage one another as we follow Christ together. We call those groups community groups, and we would love to have you get connected to one. To do so, simply fill out one of the connect cards, which you can find in the seat back pockets in front of you, and bring it to the key uh, connect counter afterwards. So, Mark, you let us close in prayer. Father God, we are thankful. We're thankful for what you have taught us today. Lord, help us to remember that we are indeed new creations, able to shed the sinful identities of our past with the Holy Spirit's present in our future. Help us to put to death those things that belong to our earthly nature. Lord, we confess that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, while at the same time we rejoice in the knowledge of being heirs to your kingdom through the belief in your Son. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your presence, your plan, your provision and protection. We thank you for your word and your sacrifice and our salvation. Father God, we lift up all these things in the name of your precious name, your Son, your Lord, Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray. Mark you as we go forward. We recall the uh, book of Numbers, chapter 6, which in part says, The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you for being with us here this morning. God bless, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>